Today is April 12, 2021. My name is Jeanette Zambrano. I'm interviewing Julie Martinez for the University Library Special Collections Archives at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, hereafter abbreviated as UTRGV. This project is in partnership with the Voso <coughs> History Center at the University of Texas in Austin. Please know, Ms. Martinez, that this interview will be placed on placed in the University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV and shared with the Voces Oil Hi Oral History Center at the University of Texas at Austin. If there, are any, are, <clears throat> if there is anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there's something you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. <clears throat> The University Library Special Collections and Archives will archive your interview along with any other photographs and other documentation you are willing to share. UTRGV University Library will retain copyright and non-exclusive right to the interview and any other materials you donate to Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV. Because we are not conducting this interview in person, we need to record you consenting to make sure you agree with our interview procedures before we continue. So I'll ask you a series of six questions. Please say yes, I agree or no, I do not agree for after each question. Do you give University Library Special Collections and Archives at UTRGV consent to archive your interview and your materials at the UTRGV University Library? I agree. Do you grant UTRGV University's Library Special Collections and Archives right, title, and interest of and copyright over the interview and any, uh, any materials you provide? I agree. Do you agree to allow UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives to post this interview on the internet where, where it may be viewed by people around the world? I agree. Do you grant the University Library Special Collections and Archives consent to share your Zoom interview with the Voces Oral, Oral History Center at the University in Austin for inclusion in the Voces of a Pandemic Oral History mini project, which will include posting the interview on the internet? I agree. As you recall, we previously filled out the pre-interview form. We used information from the pre-interview form to help in research. The entire form is, to, is kept in a secure VOSIS server at the University of Texas at Austin. Before VOSIS sends it, UTRGV University Library Special Collections and Archives, we would have stripped out any, con any contact information for, your, for, for yourself or family members. So that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at UTRGV University Library. The final two questions ask for your consent on what, what I just described. <clears throat> Do you wish to, for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at UTRGV University Library, Special Collections and Archives? I agree. On occasion, UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and Voices receive requests from journalists who wish to con contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone number or your email with the journalist? I agree. Thank you for your consent. <clears throat> we, your experience and stories mean a lot to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives. I look forward to what you have to say in the interview. Um, interview questions I will now ask. Ms. Martinez, thank you for your time. Like I said earlier, your stories and, ex and experiences are valuable to us at UTRGV Special Collections and Archives and the Voces Project. Particularly for us at UTRGV Special Collections, we are committed to preserving the stories of Mexican Americans and, Latino, and Latinos from South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley. And those who work closely with, the, with these populations during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
Because you are a secondary high school teacher who cares about the physical safety and mental well-being of her students in the community of Laredo, Texas, and because you are a daughter, sister, and a friend who is knowledgeable of the ways of COVID-19 has affected others and the and your and your inner circle. I know you have many meaningful stories and experiences to share on how COVID-19 has impacted these roles it, you carry out in your life. So for the first question I wanted to ask you is, when did you first hear about COVID-19? And how did you learn about it? I first became aware of COVID-19 back in March of 2019. It was actually the last day before we went on spring break. There were rumors within the staff members and, and around the campus that there was a case in one of the districts of Laredo that had tested positive for COVID. Later on that day, before we went home, uh, we got an administration email or messages from, uh, from our department heads that we should be ready in case we don't come back have appropriate materials to be able to help the kids from home at that time we didn't know we would be going remote learning virtual learning or package we just didn't know we just needed to be ready and prepared for whatever was coming up and what was your first reaction to the information about COVID-19 at first my reaction was kind of neutral but at this, as the days went by I became became scary the thought of contacting it and maybe not being able to make it through made me very nervous and worried. At what point did you realize this pandemic was a serious life altering event? I never did think it was a joke. I thought it was serious. The thing that made it less seem like it was less serious to me was that uh, I knew the pandemic was deadly and scary with all the deaths that had happened in other countries and it spreading to the US, that's when I had no doubt it was not a joke. Once it hits the heart, which is home in our country, we can pray for other countries and we can be, uh, we can wish everybody to resolve their problems in other countries, but when it hits home, it becomes, it becomes a threat to us. It becomes like a battle that we have to fight. It ruins, it ruins our peace, it uh, destroys our stability and insecurity. Waking up, we would be insecure every night. I feel like if I was going to wake up and I'd have a job or maybe lose a loved one to it or maybe even me get contacted with it and not make it through. Not being able to unite with my family was also uh, something ugly. Like it, The whole thing, all in all, just of all the thinking and unable to sleep and unstable feeling, you feel horrible and it drains you. Mm -hmm. And over the last few months, what media news, social media, or other sources do you rely on to keep informed about the coronavirus? I didn't want to be seeing the news over and over because I didn't want to be feeling nervous. But the news came from Facebook, from my neighbors, from somebody that knows somebody, from a staff member or or. The, the basic one that we would always go look into, somebody would always say in the room when we're sitting there and my teacher aides are there and they were like, does anybody know how the numbers are? So we'd go back into the CDC uh, website and check the numbers of people that are being tested, the number of people that are testing positive and the number of people, the number of deaths that are happening. Of course, it doesn't make any justice to us for us to be reviewing it, but we still want to stay informed. Mm -hmm. And can you share with me what you understand about COVID-19 as an infectious disease and, and any of its uh, variants? Um, or likewise, you can share with me what you don't understand about this new coronavirus. Well, I've only know what I've heard. And I've heard that I know that it's, it's a very ugly virus, that it is, that's, it's, it's, it's very strong. It's affecting and killing people regardless of color or origin. It has no boundaries. I believe that when, when somebody acquires it, it's, it's not recognized by our immune system. And that's what makes it more deadly. It multiplies if you have a pre-existing condition. Although in some people I've heard that they don't have to have pre-existing and they don't have to be elderly to be, die from it. So it could be 
it could, I feel more like it has a party in us, in the person that gets it if you have pre-existing condition. But it will hurt everybody or anybody who gets it. It will be harder for other people to fight it and it will be easier for some people to come out of it. And I know some people that haven't been able to come out of it. I believe that in the future, it will become a seasonal vaccine, just like the flu vaccine is. And just like the measles vaccine, it's just something that's going to be part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me what you know about the various vaccines that are available now to the public? And how I followed, do you I'm them? sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, no. Um, can you tell me what you know about the various vaccines that are now available to the public and how do you feel about these vaccines? <laughs> I know there's three vaccines that have been approved by the FDA, which is one of them is Moderna, one of them is Pfizer, and the other one is Johnson & Johnson. Mm -hmm. I know that they're not 100% effective, but it's a start. I know that two of them consist of two doses before they can be effective the 95% and the 97%. And there's one that is just a one dose and it's only I believe 60% or 65%. Mm -hmm. I believe that the one that's less percentage has the virus in itself, which, which is like, to me, it's compared to the, I think of the other vaccines that we already exist, that already exist. And what it does it, since they do inject the virus in you, your body starts to recognize what it needs to fight it. The other one is, was made more scientifically made where they get the strands of the virus and make your body, introduce it to your body where it will come and recognize the virus and fight it. It's very complicating, uh, but that's about all I know about the vaccine. And um, do you have a vaccination story um, you would like to share with me now or perhaps later on during the interview? Well, I've heard of several several things that have happened. Uh, some people some people say that uh, you get the vaccine and and you'll be okay. But this doctor that I follow on on uh, on Facebook says that the vaccine we can still get it even after you you get the shot. And I've heard of a story where somebody had passed away. I'm not sure if they passed away from the from the virus, but they had passed away, and they had gone to a a uh, wake uh, rosaries that they do after somebody passes away and they gathered there and some of them already had the vaccine and they ended up getting infected and one of the persons that did get infected has had been battling um, cancer and going through chemotherapy and he got very sick he got very sick and it gets scarier the mom and the brother of the guy that had that passed away actually ended up in the intubated in the hospital, both of them did. And the, the other brother was needing to get disconnected and they didn't want to tell the mom because she's still battling. I don't know if they made it or not. I haven't checked back with them, uh, but it's a very sad story. I, I, it's something that I wouldn't like for my loved ones to go through. Yes, that is very unfortunate to hear that, um, you know, that some people are, you know, um, even though they still have vaccinations, you know, they're still being able to get infected. Um, so do your family members hold the same beliefs as you as, about COVID-19 or are there some who take it more seriously or lightly? I think of everybody that has different beliefs. I do believe that what makes them think different is if they have pre-existing condition, then they're more afraid of the virus because they've heard horrifying stories about it. But I think everybody should be afraid because I've heard people that don't have a pre-existing condition that have passed away with the virus. And I do have sisters that, that are not too scared of it and they can actually go to a restaurant and eat. And, and of course they wear the appropriate cover, they cover their face and everything and shields and whatever needs to be done, keep clean, spray themselves off and stuff. And then I have the sister that won't even come out of her house and is not allowed to even talk to anybody because their daughters feel like, oh no, we have to take care of you. So she has been quarantined the whole time and, and she even has the shots and she thought, I can't wait to get my shots. And then when I get my shots, I'm gonna be able to go visit. But now that she's got the shots, now they feel like the daughter's saying, well, 
you're still a carrier now. Now you can infect the kids. So we're back to square one with them. Okay, so for these next set of questions, I'd like to talk about how you've seen COVID-19 affect family members, friends, and equal important because you are from Laredo. Excuse me. <laughs> um, because you are from Laredo and work for Laredo ISD School District. Um, Ms. Martinez, I want to ask you. Excuse me. Chance, bless you. If by chance you and your family did any traveling when COVID-19 hit, if so, where did you go and did um, did y'all follow the CDC guidelines? At the beginning of the pandemic, everything was canceled. Nobody went anywhere. Everybody was trying to stay covered, stay protected. But I feel that as time went by, people started to let their guards down. It wasn't until this year after during uh, Easter time that we did travel 167 miles to the beach. Uh, but we all stayed within our ourselves. We didn't join other families or other groups. And it wasn't as packed as everybody was saying it is. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have done some traveling and we do keep our, we keep our shields on. We do believe that. I do believe masks work. Thank God I haven't gotten the COVID myself. And I already got my second dose of the vaccine. I got the Moderna. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to let my guard down. I do know that that maybe we can, and we still have a chance of getting infected. So I will just, it's just a little extra help. And um, you said that when COVID first hit, that you and your family didn't travel anywhere. So like, what did you and your family do during that time when um, quarantine did start? Um, how did you guys pass the time? Did you um, get closer um, with like your sons and your grandchildren? Well, it was very hard. At the beginning when COVID hit, I stopped seeing my grandsons. I, I'm fortunate that I have my granddaughters that live close to me here. We live, close, we live together. And I have three sons that are close, that are always here at my house. So the, the family kind of stayed together, my immediate family, with the exception of one of my sons that doesn't live with us and his wife that works as a teacher also. So we weren't able to visit them. Mm -hmm. And so they're being missed and I believe they're missing us too, but we're not getting together. We're being very careful for their own good, for the kids' own good. They're, they're doing a remote learning online. So we're not able to see each other much due to the COVID. Okay. And how did the pandemic impact your family traditions, um, your customs, holiday celebrations, um, like birthdays, um, Thanksgiving, Christmas? Well, because like I was saying, due to the fact that my, my immediate family lives here with me, we kind of didn't have to exclude anybody except for one of my sons and my grandsons. Uh, it did affect us because of course, we weren't able to be out and about. We normally travel for Thanksgiving to see my mom and, and, and which is their grandma and my sisters, but now we had to stay home. We weren't able to go anywhere traveling stop till recently on Easter Sunday. And, um... If you attended any weddings, graduations, or funerals, how did the pandemic make these uh, um, events different or from pre-pandemic times? Well, a lot of weddings and events were canceled due to the pandemic. And unfortunately, most of the people that were on the, on the visitors that were gonna get invited mm -hmm. were, on, were not able to go. They had to stick to picking who they really wanted to, to go to be present there, whoever needed to be present, because not everybody can be the, the, the which is good, the party places are li being limited by the city officials due to the COVID. So in order to avoid the spread of the pandemic, parties are being limited to a certain amount of people per square feet. I believe it's six, 
six square feet per person or something like that. So if they have a small place, then it's gonna be a small party, immediate family members. <clears throat> and um, you mentioned before that you do have sisters that live in the Rio Grande Valley. Were, were you able to um, visit them the way you used to? If so, did, did you follow the safety guidelines, you know, just to make it um, safe? We were not able to visit at the beginning. Like I said, this past, uh, we, this past month is when we started visiting. Uh, although although uh, we do follow the safety guidelines and because we, I do have a mother that is already turned 88 years old and we have to be very careful with her. So when we do go and touch her or get near her, we must have our mask on and we must spray ourselves to make sure we're free of COVID. We don't wanna, we don't wanna be the one to infect her and, and, and be the reason for her not to be able to be with us here. We wanted her to continue to be with us, of course. What did happen in Laredo, and I noticed in, in Laredo what happened, they started uh, parades. They started birthday parades where you have no contact with the people, but you still drive by and drop off the present and they give you the goodies. Um, that became very popular in Laredo. We were having party parades all over the place. Uh, I went to a couple of them, of course, but of course we don't get off. Uh, you blow out the party sprays to the people as you go by. They have a little table set up, and you give them you get you give them the gift, and they give you your you know snack pack to go. You don't get to stick around and party like a normal party would go. And um, you also mentioned in the pre-interview that you have grandchildren. And um, what did their schools do to make learning safe for them? And how were their, how were their parents able to, you know, um, handle the big change with, from sending the kids to school from now the kids are learning at home? Well, they had a choice to send them to campus, but of course that wasn't gonna be the choice that we were gonna pick if these wanted to be careful with them not to get infected. So the, the girls are staying home and so are the boys. They're staying home at their grandma's house. They go to their grandma's house every day and they take their laptops and they do remote learning from their grandma's house. It's kind of rough because now it's not the same thing having a teacher being able to discipline you from uh, directly face to face to having a teacher where you can just turn off the, the microphone and not listen to her and be distracted. And it's not easy to not want to pay attention. You know, you don't want to stay focused because you're interested in what's going on around the house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, did you see a big change of, in your community when COVID-19 hit? If so, like, what are some things that you can tell us about? Something that I did notice and I thought it was kind of weird was that I think that the crime rate went down. A lot of people were actually in their homes. Like, so even the, even the, the people that were, that were doing crime actually got scared of the pandemic and stayed home. I thought that was like weird. Yeah, I would be surprised too. Like <laughs> that is that's very interesting. Um, the other thing that I did notice and I thought that was funny is everybody went and bought out and bought toilet paper. So if you didn't get it on time, and you hadn't gotten enough toilet paper, there were uh, there were no stocks of toilet paper anywhere. So everybody was in line, and when people were walking out of Sam's, they were walking with carts full of toilet paper rolls. I thought it was super funny, but I don't know why they felt toilet paper was more important than food. You know, it's like, it's beyond, it's bedazzled me. Um, so, so did any of your family members lose their job due to COVID-19 and how did it affect them? Yes, I had my son lose his job to COVID-19. He was, he was working for a contracted company for the railroad uh, company and the loads started slowing down. So that, I don't know if that's the, the train started bringing less loads or coming. I think the one that was coming from international stopped coming. I'm not sure, but he was laid off. 
he needed to go into uh, unemployment. Also, uh, my other son is a truck driver and the loads went super low. And it was, it got scary because I saw a couple of places on the media where people were actually attacking the, the truckers. There was a, a, I think there was one in, in Tennessee or Georgia where they actually uh, took the, was trying to uh, kill the driver, taking him off the truck and, and robbing him and doing stuff to him. So it got really scary. So yes, it, it was hard. For, it's rough for the family. And then I have a little mama papa business that literally had to be closed down. So that put me in a bind also. So it's even though I didn't lose my school job, my teaching job, I did lose a lot of customers. And how do you think the border city life in Laredo is responding to the pandemic? Do you think the the Laredo on in a whole is following the CDC recommendations like um like mask wearing and social distancing, um, or if you know <laughs> much, um, could you please give us like an example or tell us about it? I was very surprised that, like I said, I did notice that everybody was following. They, there was curfews implemented. Kids were following curfews. Adults were following curfews. Um, they were following. The, you, there was a couple of places where they would still get the gatherings together and they would gather with family members and stuff. But other than that, I do believe that Laredo was very responsible. The people of Laredo were very responsible and following curfews and following guidelines. We still, to this day, the governor had, I believe, give permission to, to not wear a mask. We still have the signs in the stores. If you do not wear a mask, you're not allowed to go inside. And I and I am glad that they're doing that because they're still, I mean, COVID is not over. Even if the government opens, it's really not over. So I don't think that he's got the right to decide for you and say, okay, you know what, just go ahead, let everybody in, get infected and get sick and let's get over it. Get, get, let's get over with it because every person's life should matter, not just the the people in politics. Everybody's life should matter. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the next set of questions, it's going to focus on your stories and experiences as an educator in the time of COVID-19. So, just so we can get a bit of a backstory, how long have you been working for Laredo ISD? This is my fifth year working for LISD. And how did you end up working in Laredo ISD? I kept applying and applying because they wouldn't hire me. I actually had to leave Laredo and work four years in another city before I got hired in Laredo to work for Laredo ISD. And I was insisting in working for Laredo ISD because I am, I wasn't born or raised in Laredo, but I got married in Laredo and I love Laredo. I just, if I leave Laredo, I miss Laredo life. I'm so culturally involved with Laredo that I cannot live out of Laredo. So when I did keep applying and I finally got my job here, I was very happy and fortunate to be hired by LISD. And what grade level do you teach? And what are some things that you would like to teach your students? I am teaching the ninth through 12th grade. I have a recently, as of March, February 24th of last year, right before COVID uh, shut down, I had changed from an English resource teacher to a unit FLS teacher. And we did, we actually did teach our kids to properly distinguish uh, how to stay clean from COVID like do the bacteria, kill bacteria, how to spray, because they already knew how to wash their hands, but we needed to teach them how to not cross contaminate. So we did give them a couple of lessons in that. We did do units of prevention and, and, and help them uh, understand why you have to wear a mask. And, and we implemented it, you know, and we still do. They know that if they're to come to, be on campus right now we're still remote but they do know and are expected that the day they return to campus they will be coming in with a mask and will be leaving it on all day 
And how did Laredo ISD handle the COVID outbreak? Did they shut down right away? Um, what safety guidelines did they put in place for their staff members and students? Well, they didn't shut down right away because we had gotten out for the spring break. But the, the week after spring break, they went ahead and announced that we would not be going back. They were going to be disinfecting the campus and we would go remote learning. At that time, when we started remote learning, it was going to be almost the end of the year. And not everybody had laptops. Not everybody had been assigned a laptop. So it was a struggle. So what do we do? We had, they had already told us to be prepared for lesson plan and, and be ready for the curriculum to implement the curriculum the way we had to do it throughout the year, only through packets. So what we did, we went ahead and we went ahead and got to, we got in groups and we went ahead and did packets for the students to make sure they kept learning at home. We stayed in contact with the parents every day. Throughout the day, we were available for the students from the regular time, eight to four. Had parents, if parents had questions, if students had questions, if administrators, anybody would have questions, we were available for them all day. And this happened from March to the end of the year. We went back in August, teachers went to campus to meet, and then COVID was still under, not in control the way it's supposed to be. And so they also sent, they went ahead and sent us home again, and we were home for a, maybe like a month and a half before we were asked to return to campus. And we were not, we are now teaching virtually from campus. I believe as of today, all staff must be, uh, must, must have reported to campus unless they had a special permission. And everybody should be virtually remote teaching at this time. And um, can you share with me how your school district, your school and your district um, helped prepare for the transitioning from going in person to remote um, teaching? And how many services or workshops did you attend? Um, or, you know, what kind of trainings did you do? <laughs> They give us a lot of technology. They did give us software training. They did give us a uh, virtual training. They did show us for those of us that were not aware of how to use or not computer savvy. We always had somebody helping us and there is still somebody. If we have a technology team on campus that has always been there, but now they're there to help us remotely. In they have, they have the software where if I have a question I can call I can call technology and I give them, they send me a code and I, I can give them remote access and he can see my computer and use the pointer from wherever he's at to show me on the computer how to fix the problem that I have. Uh, it's a very good team. We have no problem. They, they were excellent at getting students prepared back with, when we came back in August, they had computers ready and appointments for every student to come and pick up their laptop and be ready to learn online. Because if anything COVID was doing was stopping life, but education was still going. And we're still going full force. Right now, we did STAR, we're doing STAR. Uh, students, some students showed up to campus to test. Some opted not to show up and some did. So we're still going through with it. Testing has not stopped because of COVID. Education has not stopped because of COVID. We have every teacher knows their student and their data. So therefore we can, since we know the students very well and we know we have data to see where they have need, we try to fulfill their need. And if all else fails, we have contact with parent or student on telephone line and we can see them and we can, we can also go virtual and have a room just for them to question and answer or we do our daily, daily lessons online also. And um, are you concerned about the effectiveness of remote learning uh, or online learning for your, like when you're educating your students? I'm not concerned. At the beginning, I was concerned. And I felt kind of like embarrassed to, to and that's how the students feel too. If I feel embarrassed to come out on, on, on the screen and see myself and all these defects that I might have, I'm pretty sure the kids were going to the same thing. So we allowed them not to turn on their, their, their camera. If they feel uncomfortable, then we're not gonna push them further than, than we need to. 
we let them feel comfortable because that's one of the things that every teacher should know. Every teacher should know that we need to give them their space and, and let them feel comfortable so they can be able to participate. And I'll tell you what, I, feel, I am very comfortable that my students are learning because they do participate. They do like to learn. I do call them out once in a while like a teacher would do. If they're not paying attention, I can tell them, I will let them know, hello, where are you? Turn on your mic or, or turn on your camera. I need to see what you're doing. I need to see you being concentrated. I mean, it's, a, it's like the same thing. It's kind of like say, say a face-to-face -face teaching, only it's on, on, on remote. But with time, you get used to it. What started off as a phone call or paper, paper lesson or packet lesson is now on virtual lesson. Now I can go on and do a PowerPoint on the, on, on the classroom and the kids are comfortable. Now I, I can send them their work through Cami and they're comfortable doing the work through Kemi. I can see if they go in and do the work and I can see if they're being effective or not. Mm -hmm. And um, can you share with me one of your favorite lessons that you've done um, as a remote teacher that your students enjoyed? They, on a, on a weekly basis, we do a news to you story. And we get, this is an online real story. What happens is it's a story about a true story about something that is about to happen. For example, I'm going to give you, I think we did Jambuzi in New Orleans. And since New Orleans was affected by the by COVID, they were not able to have Mardi Gras and all this. So they did a, they did a, a setup where instead of having a, <laughs> a parade, they did house decoration parade. So now you could drive by and they chose a theme. I don't remember what the theme was at the time, but they chose a theme and everybody, they were given money to fix their houses and decorate them to that certain theme. So New Orleans still had something going on. It wasn't a parade because people cannot be uh, together there. They cannot be socializing, but it helped that they prepared themselves to still make it meaningful. Mm -hmm. And those stories are what I like to share my, with my students because it's what's going on. It's the real reality, what's going on. And um, just like you shared one of the moments that you enjoyed teaching your students, um, can you share with me one more, one, one of the difficult times you had with remote classroom learning? Well, one of the difficult things that can happen is we'll have some students that are sad or having trouble at home in, in, at home. And these kids rely on education or going to campus to feel secure by having their warm meals, by having a, 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 a safe environment. And due to COVID, they're having to stay home, maybe alone. Maybe we're going back to old times when kids are left alone because the mom and the dad have to go to work. And so these kids are harder to teach because they are needing their, their, they're needing their, their, what is this thing that they're needing nurturing. And as a teacher, you can provide nurturing in the classroom. I, I can tell when somebody's hungry and I can give them an extra snack. If somebody didn't make it on time because they got a blade and didn't get to go breakfast, we, we have something in the room. We can go get breakfast for them and give it to them. Now that we're going through these hard times and they're home, but they're home alone and they might not have that food in that refrigerator that, that the parent is unable to bring because a lot of parents, their hours were cut down. Stores were being shut down. So there was a lot of parents that were without a job. Parents that did not have days, that got COVID, that didn't show up to work, lost their jobs. So that's what's hard about teaching kids that are in need and in a lot of need, have a lot of need. And we're unable to provide that extra, that extra or do that extra effort to help them out. Mm -hmm. And because of COVID, have you been able to, I mean, have you had to take any extra work duties because of COVID-19? 
I believe our duties are the same. They just feel more tiring. We do have meetings that are our state mandated meetings that we do for our students to make their own IEPs. It's harder to do them because the student is not there. The parent cannot come to the meeting. Um, sometimes they'll say they will show up on the on the on the virtu virtual meeting and they can't show up because they don't have internet. There's these things are very difficult to perform a a, a real a meeting because we're missing, they don't know. And we cannot give them that feedback. Like I cannot go home and teach them at home how to use their, their internet, how to go into the meeting. These parents are not used to. A lot of my parents do not know, um, they're not technology savvy and it's very hard for them to come to the meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, what kind of policies has Laredo ISD school board or the principals enacted um, to get ahead of the disease? First of all, they do have on, on campus uh, COVID testing also. They have same day results. They also implemented where since it's purple law that we're not allowed to tell anybody, let's say I got COVID and they wanna warn us that they, they need to warn somebody around me that I had COVID, but they don't wanna viol violate my law, my rights. So what they do is send a letter. They send a letter, somebody close to you might have tested positive for COVID. Please take the time and go home and get tested. And they, they gave them at the beginning of the pandemic, they gave them the three days to get the results. If they tested negative, they, they can come back in three days. But some of them, if they tested positive, they cannot come back till after the, the result comes in negative. And at that time, it takes, it, put, it takes a burden on the family because that means there's not enough days to pay for COVID. But they did give us some days. And um, does Laredo ISD plan to resume in-class instruction um, later this semester? Actually, next the, all teachers are in campus as of today. And on Monday of next week, I believe it's the 19th, all students have a right to go back to campus. And how do you feel? Left to a parent's choice. How do, you, how, would, how do you feel about that? Well, I'm very saddened by the fact that they might go back because these kids, like I've mentioned before, I've moved into an FLS unit. These are severe kids that have pre-existing condition. I go to my house, my sons come from work. I never know if they will bring something to me. I don't never know if I will take something to the campus. And that would, it would sadden me very much to know that I would bring something to them and make them sick. I would hate to be the one to make them sick. Mm -hmm. I don't know, some of these kids have trouble breathing on their own. Imagine how they're going to be able to breathe with a mask on top of their nose mm -hmm. or with a shield. A lot of my kids drool. Mm -hmm. This is something that is going to put one to ones at risk. I mean, this is a lot of extra cleaning, a lot of extra wiping, and we already do take care of this. But now you have to remember that some of these parents have gotten COVID already. Mm -hmm. And these kids have been at risk already and are at risk every day. So it's gonna be very hard for us to have kids on campus like this. <clears throat> and um, the last question for this section, um, do you know of, of any employee or support staff member who has received a pay cut or lost um, their job? I know of a, of a of a member, a staff member that lost her insurance. It, it's right now during COVID. I'm, I don't think it's because of COVID. I think it's because of another pre-existing condition. But nevertheless, she was taken off her insurance and now she's left without insurance to pay for whatever she needs for medical expenses. And um, now to close, I will ask you some final questions. Um, 
Are you satisfied with the local response to COVID-19 in Laredo? I can say I'm a I'm neutral about it. There's some things that don't I don't like and there's some things that I don't mind. But of course it's not what I think. The CDC or the the city will make their decisions and so will U LISD and UISD. Uh, they don't consider what we're saying. They don't consider what the teachers think. They consider what the government wants. How much money is gonna get paid for attendance? How much money are we gonna lose if they don't put the kids back in school on Monday? Um, are you satisfied with the state response of COVID-19 led by Governor Greg um, Abbott? Well, he's the one that reopened the city. The city, he, he gave them the authorization to open it. And it's up to the city to reopen. It's up to the, the campuses to bring everybody back to school. Um, at the end, everybody's following the chain of command. Um, I, don't, I don't have a say so in what Governor Abbott wants to do. Um, like I said, I don't think they're considering everybody. Like for example, my students that can't breathe on their own and have to wear a mask mm -hmm. because they're forced to go back to school. And are you satisfied with the current national response of COVID-19 led by the led by President Biden and his administration? Well, since I don't know much about uh, the government and how they do their stuff, I'm I, I'm thinking they're doing pretty well. I know everybody's very happy about stimulus checks coming in. Um, it's, I guess you can say it's a little bit for a lot that we're losing. It's okay. And um, if you have <laughs> power to respond to COVID-19 with policies, laws, or workplace decisions, what would you do differently, if anything? Well, I would continue to let the students stay home based on what the parents believe, based on the criteria if they're sick or not. Uh, I believe staff members, I know some staff and members that lost their lives um, and some that didn't, but were not allowed to stay home. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's fair that they were not allowed to stay home or they didn't qualify. I think it should have been at least, if, they, if they're scared for their life, let them stay home, you know, like we're still doing virtual. Even on a lot of people, we're still teaching from campus virtually. Why can't they stay home and do virtual from, from home? Mm -hmm. They're still doing their job. <clears throat> and for the final question, <laughs> Are there any other stories or experiences that you would like to share with me that I have not asked about? Mm, I don't think I, I don't think I wrote an, uh, can't think of another story. Just, just sad ones of people, young people that have passed away without, without a, a, a pre-existing condition. They were young and of course, my friend from school, my colleague that passed away, and I felt that she fought, she had fallen and broken her ankle or something, and, and she made it through, she was fighting, and she didn't make it through COVID. It's so sad. And I know of a couple that were in their 40s, and they, the, they both passed away, the mom and the dad, and their kids. It's, it's a really ugly disease, and I really wish that everybody would consider it that it's real and there's a lot of stories out there that it's not real that it's all made up it's people are government is messing with your head and and all these kind of things and I, and I just wish everybody would understand it is real take it serious be careful wear a mask take care of yourself rinse make sure you sanitize all the time be prepared all righty 
Thank you, Ms. Martinez, for your time and your participation in the UTRGV Voices Oral History Project. Thank you for having me.